president in the Trump administration. He's been in this capacity since January 28, 2017. He has also been a regular attendee to the Principals Committee of the National Security Council. When we look at his history, he's been a naval officer. This is amazing. I mean, check out these avocations. By the way, he's three years younger than me. That really freaks me out. I mean, that is, that is I, I was stunned. I mean, in fact, I kind of looked like him about six hours ago because I was all gravelly. And, anyway, U.S. Navy officer, investment banker, urban planner, futurist, a filmmaker, producer, crony government investigator, journalist, editor, anti-establishment Tea Party activist, supporter of constitutional conservatives. When I say supporter, this isn't in here, but you know, he, he started the Ted Cruz PAC. He, $10 million he gave Ted Cruz when he got started. He believed in him. That's it's substantial. CEO of the Trump campaign and a strategist and counselor now to the president. Look at that as your resume, what you've done over the last 15, 20 years. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. You thought he's a racist? Well, that's not a, pro that's, look at me, honey. That's not a profession. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, uh, go through his early life. So, this is born named Stephen Kevin Bannon, born in North Fork, Virginia. Working class Irish Catholic family. His father is a telephone lineman. That's, I mean, that's, you know, that's just about as normal as anybody that I've, I don't know, he didn't come out of anything great. He really didn't. He had a Democrat upbringing and changed to a constitutional conservative. His family was pro-Kennedy, pro-Union, Democrat family. When he went to school, he went to Virginia Tech in 76, and he graduated, where's my thing, with a, a BA in urban planning. I thought that was a little bit liberal. It kind of is, if you think about it. Uh, you know, planning how we're supposed to live in Packham and Stackham and all that kind of stuff, and we'll see what he did with that. It's very interesting. Uh, he went to Georgetown University in 1985, and he got his master's in national security in foreign service. Now, this will all tie together as we go through his, his life, but all of this blends in with all kinds of work. It's not like I went to Georgetown. That's all I did, you know. Most people go to college. I used to hang around in college towns. You were in a college town. You went to school. You went, got out. You went, and, you went to Jack and Dan's, and you had dinner all night, right? Uh, not this guy. Uh, and then he went to Harvard University and got his Master's of Business Administration, and he graduated with honors. So let's go to the military years. Bannon signed up for the Naval Reserve in 1976 after graduating from Virginia Tech, arrived at 24 years old at the Navy's training center in Rhode Island in 1977. The following year, he set sail aboard the USS Paul F. Foster, on which he would travel mostly in the Pacific and Indian Oceans from 1978 to 1980, stopping at ports in countries such as the Philippines and Singapore. And mentioning that because that really had an impact. You got to see how the people in the world lived, you know, the, the stench of it, the, the, the problems that they have. He got to really experience that. And it was an anti-submarine destroyer whose mission was to trail, air, anti, to, to trail aircraft carriers and keep them safe. That was his job. He was an ensign and then a lieutenant junior grade. His first job gave him responsibility for engineering including air conditioning, hydraulics, and electronics. It was, quote, all of the inelegant work of the ship. That's what Edward Sonny Masso, a retired rear admiral who served with Bannon, said. He said, not just anybody succeeds at that job. Uh, so I, I can really kind of relate to that. Uh, there's a lot of things that I do other people don't do. And it's, it's, it, I just so much about this guy really interested me because he wasn't like, oh, I can't do that. How many people we see today, they can't do anything. You know, they just really are stuck with, oh, no, I, I, I don't do that. Uh, it cracks me up. Anyway, later, uh, Bannon became a navigator. So while he's in the Navy, he learns navigation and uh, to guide the ship at times with the sextant when the electronic system lost contact with satellites. And that happened once. Their whole navigation system went out, and he literally was in charge of taking that boat halfway around the world with a sextant until they could get to where they could fix that piece of equipment. Okay, um, next is 
the situation in Tehran. And so when that happened, it was just after midnight on March 21st, 1980, when the USS Foster, navigated by Stephen Bannum, met with the supercarrier USS Nimitz in the Gulf of Oman. The convoy headed near the Iranian coast, where a secret mission would be launched a month later to rescue 52 U.S. Embassy hostages held in Tehran. Bannon's ship trailed the Nimitz, which carried helicopters that would try to retrieve the hostages. But before the mission launched, Bannon's ship was ordered to sail to Pearl Harbor, and he learned while at sea that the rescue had failed. As you can see, the U.S. helicopter crashed into another aircraft in the Iranian desert, killing eight servicemen and dooming the plan to liberate the hostages. He said, I have the perfect word. And how the crew felt upon learning the mission failed, said Andrew Green, one of Bannon's shipmates. Defeated, we felt defeated. As Bannon told it, the failed hostages rescue is one of the defining moments in his life, providing a searing example of failed military and presidential leadership. What that, one that he carries with him as he serves as President Trump's chief strategist. That's what he recognized. There, was no, there wasn't any thinking. How many times have we looked what's going on in our government saying there's, there's no thinking here? So that's what he was relating to. Um, he has said he wasn't interested in politics until he concluded. Is that to me? I'm sorry, okay. He has said he wasn't interested in politics until he concluded then President Jimmy Carter had undercut the Navy and blown the rescue mission. So we're going to watch a short video here. This, this video is titled, How Bannon's Navy Service During the Iran Hostage Crisis Shaped His Political Views. It's very short, but it'll give us an idea of where he's at. Stephen Bannon, President Trump's chief strategist and the founder of Breitbart News, um, has said that the incident that he saw when he was in the Navy in 1980 has been a very important part of shaping his worldview. He was on a Navy destroyer as a navigator and a lieutenant junior grade um, when that ship went to the Gulf of Oman shortly before there was a rescue mission of 52 uh, hostages being held in Tehran. Good evening. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. Bannon has said that he really wasn't political until he got in the Navy and watched the Iran hostage rescue mission fiasco. Eight of the crewmen of the two aircraft which collided were killed. And several he wasn't there when it actually happened. So he was sort of on the edge of it, but he had seen things building up. Uh, he was near um, the Nimitz, which was the supercarrier on which the helicopters were to launch for the rescue missions. Well, according to his shipmates, um, Steve Bannon was very deeply affected and angry that President Carter, the president at the time of the failed um, Iran rescue mission, that he was upset with the way things went down. The eight service members were killed. The hostages were not rescued by Jimmy Carter. And this was also in the post-Vietnam era. According to one of Bannon's friends, we quote in the story, um, Bannon saw you know, sort of an antipathy towards the military, was upset by that. After um, 1980, he went directly to the Pentagon, uh, right at the time Reagan was elected, and saw then uh, President Reagan do a big military buildup, reviving the Navy in certain ways. And he sort of idolized Ronald Reagan. But I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. So he saw that buildup, and that made a big impact on him. In fact, one of his friends told us that when they were getting ready to leave the Pentagon around 1983, um, this friend said that Bannum told him that he'd like to come back one day as Secretary of Defense. Well, that didn't happen, but now he's chief strategist. Some might say that's even a more influential position given what Steve Bannon is and does mean to Donald Trump. Today, he is known as a very conservative uh, influence on President Trump. Uh, he was playing an influential role in the uh, immigration temporary ban on immigrants, certain immigrants from seven Muslim-dominated countries, including Iran. So if you hook these things together, back in 1980, he was near the coast of Iran during the rescue uh, mission fiasco. Um, he would have been well aware that uh, into the streets of Tehran, there were people shouting death to America while the hostages were being held there. Uh, and at this time today, he's also raised alarms about the Muslim world and certain radicals in the Muslim world and certain countries that are dominated by Muslims. So there does seem to be a line in his thinking um, going back all the way to 1980 up until today.
So in October of 1980, with the Foster in port at Long Beach, California, Bannon went to retired Rear Admiral Masso's home to watch a debate between Carter and Reagan. Sorry, he wasn't retired then. He's still the Rear Admiral. Uh, but Masso said that he watched that debate like a prize fight. That's how, you know, do you remember when you got interested in politics? Do you remember when all of a sudden it was like important to see what was going on and how your guy was doing and, and whether or not you really felt that it was coming together? That's what was going on with Bannon in 1980. Three months later, after Reagan won the election, Bannon was working for the new president, serving as an assistant in the office of the chief of naval operations at the Pentagon. That's pretty, that's pretty astounding. He watched with satisfaction as Reagan increased the military budget and strengthened the Navy, with most of the focus on combating the Soviet Union. He served for three years and simultaneously studied national security and earned a master's degree at Georgetown University while he's at the Pentagon. Holy mackerel. Bannon decided to make a change in his education during this time, though. He said, quote, somebody told me if you want to go to Wall Street, you have to go to Harvard Business School. That's a big jump, okay? Um, so we're now looking at the Wall Street years. After receiving an MBA from Harvard University, which he worked at while serving at the Pentagon, Bannon worked at Goldman Sachs as an investment banker in the mergers and acquisition department from 1984 to 1990. When he left the company, he held the position of vice president. And in 1990, Bannon and several colleagues from Goldman Sachs launched Bannon and Company, a boutique investment bank specializing in media. Through this company, Bannon negotiated the sale of Castle Rock Entertainment and wound up accepting, uh, he sold that, that entertainment group to Ted Turner and as payment, Bannon and Company accepted a financial stake in five television shows, including Seinfeld. A little bit later in 1998, Bannon and Company was purchased. Now, Steve Bannon is really quiet about his financial holdings and such investments. However, if Bannon owned only 1% share of the profits in the sale, he would have made about $32.5 million since 1998 in that one transaction. So this is where <laughs> Bannon's urban planner and futurist personality comes in. You remember this? Anybody remember the pictures of this? Okay, so in 1993, while still managing Bannon and Company, Bannon was, make, was made acting director of the Earth Science Research Project Biosphere 2 in Oracle, Arizona. I mean, I would have figured those guys were out there living inside this thing, and they, they you know, before Skype, they had to figure out some way to talk to somebody without breathing on them. So this is, this is really amazing to me that he was doing these other things at the same time. Under Bannon, the project shifted its emphasis from researching space exploration and colonization toward pollution and global warming. <laughs> and so I, I, really, I could not find out what he learned about global warming, but considering his views, I could speculate. <laughs> right? Okay. So he left the project in 1995. So following the sale of Bannon and Company, uh, Steve Bannon became an executive producer in Hollywood. Now, what do film producers bring to the industry? Anybody know? Money. money. Okay. So uh, he brought money to the industry. He was the executive producer for Anthony Hopkins' 1999 Oscar-nominated film, Titus. Bannon became a partner with entertainment industry executive and talent manager Jeff Kanitz at the firm. Um, a, a firm, uh, a film and television management company. Knitz managed the Backstreet Boys and had a list of clients that included Ice Cube and Martin Lawrence. I've never heard of Martin Lawrence and I, I've got plenty of Ice Cubes in the house so I know what those are. Um, <clears throat> the firm acquired former Disney chief Michael Orbitz's company, Artist Management Group. And as Vanity Fair reported, Orbitz spent a hundred million dollars building the company and Ban made an offer of $5 million for it. And then he negotiated it up to $12 million. I mean, this is the kind of background he already had from working at Goldman Sachs with the, the, the trades that he was doing. It was amazing, he just ran into this thing. 
So after that, he started to make, put more of his money. Oh, I'm sorry, I was off a little bit there. But so he started putting his money into his own films. So in 2004, Bannon made a documentary about Ronald Reagan titled The Face of Evil, which ultimately is how he connected with Andrew Breitbart. The story came from Peter Schweitzer's 2003 book, Reagan's War. Now, does anybody in here at this point know who Peter Schweitzer is? Okay, we've got like two hands up. Now, you're going to catch this guy's name because you're going to find there's this connection between Bannon and Schweitzer and, 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 uh, and Breitbart and, and another money guy. His name will come up here all the and, and these people have been responsible. I just want to, you want to share it ahead of time. They've been responsible for why we're here today. If they hadn't done this, we wouldn't be here today. It's just an amazing story. Amazing story. So, um, you know, it's a great way, yeah. So, uh, Peter Schweitzer, it's a name you want to remember because it's, they're in charge today. Okay, so with the re release of Cochise County, uh, in 2004, and border war in 2006, it started to become clear where Bannon's political focus was taking him. In, uh, oh, that's, that slide's not coming up. So there was a slide here that also talked about, uh, well, that, no, no that's, that, that's good enough. So these are two that he did to appease his audience. I mean, people were saying, why are you doing all this political stuff? So he, he did a, a, video, a movie on Notre Dame football, and he did one with Val Clymer on the chaos experiment. Uh, because he wanted to show the world that he could film, produce contemporary entertainment. And then in 2010, he released Generation Zero. Now, we've shown that movie at movie night. Yeah, a long time ago, but, you know, it came out in 2010. And w But it was based on this novel, uh, 1997 book called The Fourth Turning by William Strauss and Neil Howe. And this book... Um, you can still get it at Amazon. It, it, it's one of the driving forces in Bannon's worldview. He is seen with a dog-eared book and quoting from it often. He's, you see him walking around the White House with it. This is, this is like his little Bible. And we're going to hear more about the four turnings uh, from a piece of, of Bannon's video here a little bit later on in the presentation. So in 2010, he also brought us Battle for America with Dick Morris. Remember back in 2010, we really thought Dick Morris was a real conservative guy, remember? And then he kind of waffled because he's floating around the Democrats. Remember, he worked with the Clintons and all that. And then he's, now he's back. All of a sudden, he's a real Trump guy. It's just... So, you know, knowing these people's history is really important. Otherwise, we just, you know, we walk in on it. We go, oh, he's a great guy. Well, you just, you got to get the big picture to know where these people are coming from. Okay? Yeah, and we showed Fire from the Heartland. Uh, that was the, uh, called The Awakening of the Conservative Woman featuring Michelle Bachman, Ann Coulter, Dana Loesch, and Cynthia Loomis. Now, uh, next he brought out The Undefeated, which was Sayo Palin's story. You know, mayor from Wasilla to governor of Alaska to her candidacy for vice president and her rise to national prominence. This movie details how she became the darling of the Tea Party movement. And the film ends at the Madison rally where Palin challenged Republicans to fight like a girl. <laughs> you remember that? That was great. I remember that. The last shot... Huh? Yeah, like a hockey mom, right, right. The last shot is of Palin saying into the camera, Mr. President, game on. <laughs> it's a good movie. Uh, 2011 also saw the release of Occupy Unmasked, which we have and we've never shown to you. I sit down and I watch it, and as, as he says in another piece that I was researching, he says, you know, you watch that movie and you feel like you have to take a hot, steamy shower when you're done. I mean, these, these people are, this is like the Berkeley crowd. I mean, this is, you could just say, well, you know, they just look human. You know, that's the problem with a lot of our society. They've just gone down the tank so far that it's, it's beyond us to be able to fix this stuff. But uh, uh, so Occupy a Match, which the purpose of it was to take a critical look at the Occupy movement that was happening back there. Remember Occupy Wall Street? And Andrew Breitbart and producer Stephen Bannon contend, see they were working together now, but they contend that the Occupy movement is sinister, it's violent, and organized with the purpose of destroying the American government. That was the intention. That was a total intention. So now we get to 
2012. What was 2012? It's an election year, right? And so with the 2012 election year at hand, Bannon pointed to both the corruption in D.C. and the continuing failure of the Obama administration. So you see the theme here. Steve Bannon was and is passionate in exposing the corruption in Washington, D.C. And, you know, so when we think about here we are just four, four and a half years after that, and we have all these new people who have come in to vote to take away this corruption. They could feel it. They don't understand all this history. They don't have any idea about it. They just want to change it. They want to get rid of it and move on. And so we really have to understand and be able to help them because they need to be grounded. They need to know what this past is all about. Um, next, uh, in 2013, uh, he produced um, Sweetwater, which was a Western thriller featuring Ned Harris. And Rickover, though, in 2014, is the story of the United States Navy Admiral Rickover, who is responsible for the use of nuclear reactors and ships. Known as the father of the nuclear navy, he may well go down in history as one of the navy's most important officers. That's a quote from Bannon. Uh, it, it, I, I looked at you could you could talk for two or three hours just about that guy. It was an amazing story. So was it political? It had political parts to it. His this admiral, but but uh, those are the movies. Those few right there were the ones that really didn't have much to do with politics. Where all the rest of it does. So when we look at uh, 2016 here. <laughs> we had fun with this movie, Clinton Cash. Who's it written by? Peter Schweitzer. Remember that name? Okay. Is an investigation of the foreign benefactors of the Bill and Hillary Clinton and Clinton Foundation. And if you watch this thing, it breaks down five or six of the huge scandals that they had, all the money they pilfered from the American public that they were going to give to Haiti and how they didn't. Oh, just rotten people. Also released in 2016 was this movie called Torchbearer, which fe featured uh, Duck Dynasty's Phil Robertson. It was an election year urgent wake-up call for American Christians. And as we've heard from many, many sources, I mean, 30 million American Christians needed to get out and vote to make things happen. I don't know what the final numbers on that was, but that was part of Bannon's effort there to do that. So over Bannon's film career, he worked on 19 projects, and only four were not political. So he put his money where his mouth is. That's all I got to say about that. I mean, some of them seemed like a little bit of a B-grade movie, but they were all great intentions, good scripting, and all that sort of thing. So next, we move to Breitbart. So what does Bannon have to do with Breitbart? Well, in 2007, remember, he met Breitbart back with the uh, filming of the, uh, the Reagan the Reagan movie. And uh, so he knew who he was, kept hanging around him. But in, in 2007, Bannon was a founding member of the board of Breitbart News, an online far-right news opinion and commentary website, which according to Philip Elliott and Zeke Miller of Time Magazine, has pushed racist, sexist, xenophobic, and anti-Semitic material into the vein of the alternate right. <laughs> so. Um, so, <laughs> oh, it is a great picture, isn't it? That came from the treehouse. Um, so, uh, so Breitbart News paid a central role in the 2000 Acorn video controversy. Do you all remember that one? That was great, which resulted in the reorganization of the Association of Community Organizers for Reform Now, Acorn. Okay? as well as its loss of private and government funding. How fun is that? Take away their money. Breitbart News contributor Hannah Giles posed as a prostitute, fleeing an abusive pimp, and seeking tax and legal advice on how to run an illegal business that included the use of underage girls in the sex trade, while James O'Keefe, who's been very busy this last year with his work, um, another contributor, posed as her boyfriend. They videotaped meetings with Acorn staff who gave advice on house buying and how to account on tax forms for the woman's income. Now, uh, in May of 2011, Breitbart's big journalism website reported on a sexually explicit photo linked to, on New York Representative Anthony Weiner's twi Twitter feed. 
Wiener Twitter feed. Hmm, okay. Wiener initially denied that he had sent a 21-year-old female college student the link to the photo, but later admitted to inappropriate online relationships. <clears throat> On June 6th, Breitbart News reported other photos Wiener had sent, including one that was sexually explicit. Wiener subsequently resigned from his congressional seat on June 21st. There's nothing like transparency, you know? It, it just yeah, really works. Wiener is married to Uma. Yeah, yeah. and Wiener was, is married to Uma. Maybe it's, maybe it's like the Black Widow, huh? That would work. Okay, <clears throat> on, on March 12th, after founder Andrew Breitbart's mysterious death, Bannon became executive director of Breitbart News LLC, the parent company of Breitbart News. Under his leadership, Breitbart took a more alt-right and nationalistic approach toward its agenda. Bannon declared the website, quote, the platform of the alt-right. He took ownership of it. It's great, he it said in 2016. So, in February 2014, Bannon announced the addition of approximately 12 staff members and the opening of Texas and London based operations. The new offices were the beginning of an expansive plan that included the addition of new regional sites roughly every 90 days, with new locations to include Florida, California, Cairo, and Jerusalem. Did you guys have any idea that Breitbart had spread out that far? I didn't either. I, it's just amazing. So according to a 2014 Pew Research Center study, 79% of Breitbart's audience report having political values that are right of center. Can't, can't, but you, well, of course, right? So in 2015, Bannon changed focus. He started to bring focus on the millennial political aspect and began courting their thoughts and perspective. Why is that important? This is just this year, okay, last year, 2015. Why is that important? Look around the room. Look around our room. And what Bannon says is that it, it, that's our future. We must find out what's driving their thinking and we must help them to be able to see a different path. Because, uh, I mean, we did that to them. I, mean, I don't want to get offline here too far, but we did that. That's our responsibility. We are the ones that let our educational system drive this way for the last 50 years. We did that. So we need to fix it. Okay. In April of 2016, the Southern Poverty Law Center wrote that the website was openly promoting and had become associated with the beliefs of the alt-right. They must have read his post from a year before. Okay. And so then on August 17th of 2016, we're getting right up now. Bannon stepped down from his role as executive chairman to join the Trump campaign and its new CEO. That's when he, yeah, Lewandowski stepped down and that's when, and, and Paul Manafort got in and there were problems. Steve Bannon had already been, ha that he was already dovetailed with him and so he stepped down from Breitbart and started to run the Trump campaign. And speaking of his role at Breitbart, Bannon said, we think of ourselves as virent, virent, virulently, that's a hard word for me, virent, virent, I found the, yeah, it, it doesn't look the same as it's supposed to sound, virulently, anti-establishment, particularly anti the permanent political class. That's the thing, and we all talk about the need for term limits, but we must understand the reason, the reason we're stuck is because of that 50 years that we haven't been teaching. Two generations, two generations of people who have come up, they have no idea what public virtue is about. They have no understanding at all of why a person would want to get into office to be able to keep and maintain what our country was founded on, not to be progressive and to get in there and change it so that it's new and and um, transgender bathrooms. Let's just throw that in there, man. Well, how do you go from how do you go from being conservative to that? It's just crazy. Okay, but we did that, and he understands that. And uh, so he's out of the campaign. I think I got to click off. All right, now, so the Breitbart website. Who took over for him at Breitbart? What's that? Who took over for him at Breitbart? I'm not well. Okay. 
No. Do you want to do this? <laughs> okay, but I'll go ahead and answer a question. So when he stepped down at Breitbart, um, Peter Schweitzer became the chief editor of Breitbart News. Now, we're going we're gonna to cover more about what that is here shortly. So she hasn't seen this presentation, so that's all right. But she always likes to do that. That's good. Now, the Breitbart website broke a new record in August of last year with over 1 billion page views since January of that year. That is amazing. According to leading analytics giant Newswhip, Breitbart News is the number one political Facebook page in the world with two million more engagements than number two Huffington Post. That's, that's pretty astounding. And, and while that was going on, <laughs> while that's going on, Bannon co-founded uh, the Government Accountability Institute, known as GAI, whose mission it is to investigate and expose crony capitalism, misuse of taxpayer monies, and other governmental corruption and malfeasance. That's a mission statement for you. The Government Accountability Institute of the conservative nonprofit investigative research organization was located in Tallahassee, Florida. GAI was founded in 2012 by Peter Schweitzer and Stephen Bannon with funding from Robert Mercer and family. These are the people who have got us here, folks. These are the people who have done everything to help this conservative movement over the last 10, 15 years in a big way. They put the money up for it. Schweitzer serves as that group's president. The group is known for its involvement in the publication and investigative books, Clinton Cash, the untold story of how and why foreign governments and businesses help make Bill and Hillary rich, and Bush Bucks how public service and corporations help make Jeb rich. Both were written by Peter Schweitzer. This is the image. This is the group. This is the GAI. There's Bannon back there with his baggy shorts and drinking a cup of coffee and you know, just being himself. And, and these people around the table, um, the names are unimportant. I got them here. You can read them. But the cheapest person there is making 300 grand a year from these guys. One of those people's making 650 grand a year. They are in this. They are dedicated. Look at them. They, they're working. I mean, this was a work picture. This is, this is not a posing picture. And they are young. And they are millennials. And they are thinking. And that makes me excited. Because that's the kind of... This is what's going to Trump. This is what he's reading. This is what he's hearing. Do you want to say something? When, when you hear the, the uh, leftists talk about these billionaires that are running our government, these are people who earn their money and want to give back, not criminal politicians that are stealing from us and not want to give a cent back. Yeah, thank you. That's important. Exactly. So this was uh, the first piece of work that they put out was Clinton Cash, which is a phenomenal research, just phenomenal. Uh, I. I I don't know how much effect it really had in the last election, but boy, what, everybody that saw that movie was just wowed by it, just wowed. Well, and he put it online free. Yeah, he did, he did. Yeah, it was only, at, it went through the movies about, what, two and a half months, and then he put it online, and he said, that's it, you know, so he, he it wasn't about making money on it. Okay, the, the SPLC hate watch, now this is a, we see this page quite often. We have, uh, uh, there's people here in our area that SPLC has on their list and, you know, the hate people. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, we haven't quite made it there yet, but, you know, people do say we're the leaders of hate. Uh, but look what it says here. The alt-right fears deep state retribution against Trump. And the date here is February 27th, last month, just a few days ago. This, is, this, is, this isn't the only one. There's several of them up here about... Uh, a Bannon, that's what I was searching on, uh, but uh, it says, noted, as the so-called deep state turns into a real point of political discussion, the white nationalistic alt-right sees in its shadow an effort to undermine an administration whose ear they feel they have. Now, it's obviously true here. Uh, note the tweet from neoconservative shill Bill Kristol. Obviously strongly prefer normal democratic and constitutional politics, but if it comes to it, prefer the deep state to the Trump state. You know who this guy is? 
You guys all know who he is? Okay, I mean, this, this, is, this, is, this, is what, this is our enemy. This is why Bannon said they are the enemy. So we, we got to know how, and we got to take a strong stand against that. So here we go. Let's pause and get a full impact of this scene. We have Reince Priebus, White House Chief of Staff. Now, I got to tell you, when Reince was picked, my skin crawled. I thought, oh my God, how are you going to, what are you going to do with this guy? You know? But on the other hand, I mean, you know, within 10 seconds, I'm saying to myself, well, John, uh, you've been saying all along, what are you going to do if Trump wins? Who's he going to work with in Congress? Who does he know there? And I think, well, he's got to know somebody. He must have made some deals somewhere along the way. You know, it's like Judge Napolitano. We all know who he is. And I was, I was so excited, you know, when I found out that, that Judge Napolitano has done several business dealings and is one of Donald Trump's biggest friends. I mean, you know, it's good to know you got friends like Judge Napolitano. But, uh, but, but that's different than now you're the president. How are you going to communicate with Congress? Well, this is how you do it. You know, so I don't know how I don't know what was made or what was said, all that kind of stuff. But there he is, White House Chief of Staff. Next to him is Steve Bannon, Chief Strategist and Senior Counselor to the President. Next to him, Sean Spicer, the Press Secretary. Next to him is General Michael Flynn, who was targeted for National Security Advisor. I think we're going to see him back in the White House shortly. I have no doubt about it because uh, the, too much is coming on on how this stuff was all stacked up and it was nothing stuff. Okay. Then we have Bryce, Vice President Mike Pence and of course our President Donald Trump. All of these people, all of these people surrounding our President are knowledgeable, they have high energy, they're productive people, they're all successful in their own careers and powerful within their circles of influence. You gotta understand that these are not people that walk out the door and nobody knows who they are. They are important people. It's reassuring to have a person with true paleoconservative constitutional values like Steve Bannon steering from the helm to keep the focus on our president's agenda and strategize the best way to accomplish those goals. This is an amazing working man's White House. I, we just, I've never seen a picture anywhere else um, of another president who had people that I would admire as much as what's in that picture. So let's get some quotes here. Uh, Ross Douthat authored a column in the New York Times about the new political battlefield. He said, perhaps we should speak no more of left and right, liberals and conservatives. From now on, the great political battles will be fought between nationalists and internationalists, nativists versus globalists. Taylor Lewis in The American Thinker wrote, Stephen Bannon explained the difference between economic populists like himself and the jet-setting crowd. We're a nation with an economy, not an economy just in some global market pace with open borders, but we are a nation with a culture and a reason for being. You know, that's what our millennials are looking for. That is what they're looking for, is a reason for being. Why are we here? Uh, you know, we look since the end of World War II, one of the industries that's just taken off uh, in, in the United States greatly is the personal development industry with many, many companies who are helping people to get grounded. And it stems from this missing attribute in life is that uh, this reason for being. Um, that's the deal. So, you know, in President Trump's first address to a joint session of Congress, as far as being an anti-globalist, he said, free nations are the best vehicle for expressing the will of the people. And, um, and America respects the right of all nations to chart their own path. Ron Paul could have said that. Ron Paul could have said that, okay? And he continues, says, my job is not to represent the world. My job is to represent the United States of America. And that's what we've got. Yep. That's what we got. I love this one on the media. The media should be embarrassed and humiliated and keep its mouth shut and just listen for a while. I want you to quote this. The media here is the opposition party. That's about as straight out as you get. Okay, they don't understand this country. They still do not understand why Donald Trump is the president of the United States. 
this was just, you know, a few months back, and it's been festering ever since. Now, on racism, there was an uh, interview that was with Mother Jones in August of last year, and Bannon acknowledged that white nationalists and anti-Semites are drawn to the so-called alt-right movement. He said, he said uh, look, are there some people that are white nationalists that are attracted to some of the philosophies of the alt-right? Maybe. He said, are there some people that are anti-Semitic that are attracted? Maybe. Right? He says, maybe some people are attracted to the alt-right that are homophobes. Right? He said, but that's just like there are certain elements in the progressive left and the hard left that attract certain elements. See, that's the part I like. This guy's smart. He doesn't put people down. He just recognizes that in our uniquenesses and our differences, we're going to be attracted to different groups and different ideologies. But you know what I love about Trump, and it's obvious with Bannon, is it's not about any of that. It's all about being productive. It's about being a productive human being and fitting into society and making a difference. You want to be, you want to make, I mean, all of these guys that are in these pictures, they make money, you know, and, and, and they're giving back, and they're giving back. So that's, uh, we, we need to keep that in, in consideration here. Okay, where do they leave off? Oh, okay. Okay, Bannon on women. So in 2011 radio interview, Bannon had a hypothesis about why progressive women vilify prominent conservative women like Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin. So this goes back to 2011. Okay? And he said there, quote, that's why there are some unintended consequences of the women's liberation movement. He said that, in fact, the women that would lead this country, speaking about those in 2011, 2012 that were coming up to run for president or vice president, Sarah Palin to be there. She says, in fact, women would lead this country, would be pro-family. They would have husbands. They would love their children. They wouldn't be a bunch of dykes that came from the Seven Sisters School up in New England. That, he, says, he says, that drives the left insane, and that's why they hate these women. See, that's the thing. It's, it's you know, so uh, now... Here, these are some other ones. Here's, here's Bannon on the GOP establishment. So according to The Atlantic, Bannon told a gathering of conservatives, we don't believe there is a functional conservative party in this country, and we certainly don't think the Republican Party is that. Okay? And he added, it's going to be an insurgent, center-right, populist movement that is virulently anti-establishment and it's going to continue to hammer this city, both the progressive left and the institutional Republican Party. And that's where we're at. That's exactly where we're at right now. So, um, and uh, let's move on to the next slide here. So we think of ourselves, he said, as virulently anti-established, particularly anti-progressive. And then when he was talking to the Washington Post, he told them, in, you know, in the context of that conversation, he said, we say Paul Ryan was grown in a Petri dish at the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> and, you know, and I know there's a lot of people who really find that the Heritage Foundation has, it's, is a good, but is it establishment? It, wh what's the goal? You know, when we start to look at how many people really follow the ideology of the Council on Foreign Relations and the, and the one world globalist government, that's what we don't want to have. You know, we'd like the whole world to work well, but why don't they work well because they want to be like us? Why don't, they, why don't we all work together and be productive and, and have our own economies? I mean, that's, that's really where we're striving for now at this point. Okay, um, so now we're going to watch a video. I promised you to have the video with him. So this is back again in, in 2011, so it's five and a half years ago. 2011, it seems like a, a decade or more ago, right? Uh, so it's five and a half years ago when he was speaking a year before the 2012 election. So that's where his mind was. Everything was focused on what they got to get done over the next year in order to win that election. And notice his thoughts from then and compare those thoughts to his actions and the agenda of the president today. We 
please welcome Steve Bannon. September 18th, 2008, at 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, the Republican appointed uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve and the Republican um, Secretary of the Treasury, a guy I used to work for at Goldman Sachs, Hank Paulson, went to the White House to see the President, a Republican, I might add, and uh, told him because of the mishandling of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers a few days before, you know, over the weekend on September 15th, where they didn't really calculate because it's quite complicated. They didn't realize that Lehman Brothers was the beating heart of the world's commercial paper market. Uh, and that the entire world and the commercial paper market is what funds the working capital of all the large corporations in the, in the world, that the world's financial system had basically frozen. And on Wednesday, for all you guys that have money market accounts, the prime reserve fund broke a buck for the first time. In other words, if you wrote a check for $1,000, you're going to get $900 back. Uh, the, um, the Fed had pumped $500 billion of liquidity in 24 hours into the system. Uh, and by the way, we know all this now because of Representative Kanjorski, who told it on C-SPAN and because of testimony in front of Congress. Uh, they did the spreadsheets and ran the numbers. They went and told the president that um, they needed an immediate $1 trillion of liquidity into the system or that the American financial system would freeze up and basically implode in 72 hours, that the world's financial system would implode in about three weeks, and that they could not guarantee um, any social and political chaos within a month. Uh, so President Bush sent them up to Capitol Hill. He didn't attend the meeting. He sent them up to Pelosi and Ken Jorsky and all these guys. And that's where they came up with TARP. Actually, Secretary Paulson went up with a three-page memo, if you remember. Uh, it was a bill. They needed a trillion dollars that night. Um, and the question gets to be, when you looked at the fiasco, and we'll go through some numbers in a second, um, how did a situation that, um, and we had some pretty sizable enemies in the 20th century, Hitler, Mussolini, the military junta in Japan, the Kaiser, uh, Lenin, Mao, Stalin, uh, you know, you go on and on and on. These guys couldn't even envision what we had done to ourselves, much less execute it. They actually told the president, unless you give us a trillion dollars immediately, and now we know from Bloomberg it was about $5 trillion of liquidity they needed into the system, of which, by the way, we've never really had an accounting, right? We don't have an accounting today of what really went on, of what liquidity got put into the system. This crisis is of such a magnitude it's unprecedented in our country's history and unprecedented in the world's history. Let me just walk you through some math. Um, depending on the assumptions you make, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, and I realize people say, oh, they're contingent liabilities, but they're, they're, they're pretty locked in unless you uncontingent them. The liabilities of those three are anywhere from 60 to $100 trillion. At state level, the state governments today are about $3 trillion underwater. Municipal governments, you see in Harrisburg, the capital of Pennsylvania, I think just got taken over yesterday. Municipal governments, I think, are something like $2 trillion underwater. Uh, municipal uh, employee uh, pension funds are $2 trillion. Corporate pension funds are $1 trillion. Th the biggest problem we have, which never gets talked about in any debate, has not been brought up one time, the trade deficit, which every quarter, all the goods we buy from China and all the foreign oil we buy, it's seven trillion dollars. It's the beating heart of our problem. Not one question in eight debates has been asked about it. Doctor, there's a guy named Dr. Kotlikoff on my radio show. In the Reagan administration, Harvard trained PhD, head of Boston University's economics department, very low-key guy. They call him the $200 trillion man. He will walk you through a set of mathematics that shows you the liability side of the balance sheet's about $200 trillion. And his math is not that far off when you look at the assumptions. The total assets in our country, let's, let's talk about a balance sheet and an income statement so you can see the scale of the problem we got. All the assets combined, I think, in our country, all the stocks, 
NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, privately held companies, LLCs, all of your companies, okay? All the cash, all the gold, all the real estate adds up to about 50 to $60 trillion in assets. And we have $200 trillion, and some of those are contingent liabilities. But we are upside down. The industrial democracies have a massive problem today we've never had. We are highly overleveraged. We have to go through a massive deleveraging. And we've built in a welfare state that is completely and totally unsupportable. Now, why this is a crisis, and by the way, Barack Obama is not the problem. Barack Obama is a symptom of a problem. We have to remove Barack Obama. I, I, I don't doubt that for a second. We, we, we have to remove Barack Obama as President of the United States. But that's only the, and let's talk about this. We had this huge, the reason you're here today on a Tuesday night, listening to some really great guys who are sacrificing their, their, their lives and, and you guys to come to support in one of these new organizations, when you could be doing anything else, and you're the kind of the thin blue line of, what, of what's going to save us, because I go around and talk to, to groups. Last night I was in Torrance. It's 100 people. It's always the same 100 guys, men and women, throughout the country every time I go. Okay? That's the scary thing. You, you are the guys that are really going to save us. So, so the, the, the problem is, is that these numbers are so esoteric that even the guys on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs, the guys I work with, and the guys in the Treasury Department, because they've made some massive mistakes, and they're the first to admit that. But it's so tough to tie this together because the numbers are so esoteric when you talk about a trillion and a half dollar deficits and trillion, three trillion dollar in federal spending and all this. It's the reason the Tea Party, after Santelli's rant, the reason the Tea Party revolt came about, it's the first time in our country's history that we've had a center-right movement principally led by women, right? If you look at the Tea Party, for the Jasons and all the guys, and I was out there in the, in the Americans First Prosper and all the guys, this was the first time there were women out there, right, moms. And the reason it is is that women's are the, the women are the chief operating officer of the American family. You know, they don't need to know it's trillions of dollars. They know that every bag of groceries is 100 bucks. They know to fill up an SUV is 100 bucks. And they know that Buddy and Sis are going to a state college, state university, coming back $50,000 in debt and living back in, the, you know, in their room with the soccer trophies they got with, 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 no, with no job prospects. The reason I named the first film Generation Zero, the, the generation in their 20s and 30s, we, we've wiped them out. This is the first time in American history a generation's actually cha you know, given over command of something and we haven't passed on any positive increase in net worth. Right? The sad thing about the Occupy Wall Street, when you look at those kids, is how ill informed they are. That's the product. That's the product of the American education system. They have no more earthly idea of the fundamentals of our liberty, the fundamentals of free market capitalism, and they know ze absolutely nothing about our history. That's why I call them Generation Zero. We've passed on zero net worth, and we've really you know, and, and yet I see part of that, my daughter's part of that generation, that are fighting a war that's tougher than any war that our grandparents fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. So there is tremendous potential there. But we are passing them on unless we act immediately, unless groups like you can come together, because the political establishment is not going to do it. And people go, how can you say that? I say, let's just look at the empirical evidence. Since the Tea Party revolt, which the Republican establishment did not support, and if you remember and look back, go to Fox and look at guys I respect tremendously. William Crystal, Dr. Krautheimer, David Fromm. You look at all the, George Will, look at all the intelligentsia of the Republican Party and in the, in, in the conservative uh, intelligentsia. They were mocking the Tea Party. They were mocking these grassroots organizations. The reason I made these films is that my buddies on Wall Street kept saying, oh, these women are a bunch of bimbos. I said, you know, I know Governor Palin and I know, um, Congressman Bachman, I know these women in the Tea Party, they're every bit as tough and smart as you guys are. I mean, think about it. If the elites are so good, how did we get in this jam? Right? And, but, here's the, but here's the part that, that, and that's why groups like you, I'm not promoting you. If, if you don't hang together, this country falls apart. Well, becomes something very different at the other side of this crisis, because this is the fourth great crisis in American history. We had the revolution, we had the Civil War, 
We had the Great Depression and World War II. This is the great fourth turning in American history. And we're going to be one thing on the other side. And by the way, the reason this is so tough is that before, we didn't have competitors like China. Uh, or we weren't in hock to guys that are our enemies. Or we had an education and a value system of Judeo-Christian values that a guy like Abraham Lincoln could read the King James Bible, Shakespeare's plays, and Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, and that's all he had, right? And he, that he wrote the second inaugural address and the Gettysburg Address, because that's all you needed, right? Um, if you look at it for a second, this, the, the victory in 2010, and because of groups of Club for Growth, Americans for Prosperity, the Tea Party movement, grassroots movement, it was an unprecedented victory, right? Not only at the federal level, if you go down and look at the state level, if you look at, we eviscerated the Democratic Party in the South and in the Midwest in state legislatures and in, in gov governorships, it was a massive victory. We, we got virtually no credit for that, right? The mainstream media and even the, even the Republican apparatus. Remember, the Republican Party came out with a marketing document 60 days before that that said we're going to cut $100 billion, the Pledge to America, right? Okay. The two big things, TARP being one, the second being the, the, the budget cuts after the 2010, right, the first budget, we cut $30 billion. And by the way, the Tea Party Patriots, if you go to Jenny Beth Martin and Mark Meckler's site, they say we actually increased by $3 billion, but it was a $30 billion cut, not a $100 billion cut because of all kind of, you know, we're, you know, we're prorated, we're in the year. The second was the debt debate. The federal spending, which is every bit as bad as the deficit, it's the scale of federal spending because it sucks dollars out from everywhere else. Federal spending, I think, is $3.5 trillion, $3.75 trillion for the next two years, roughly. It adds up to $7.5 trillion dollars in two years. In the debt debate we just had, we cut $60 billion. $20 billion one year and $40 billion the next. The, the numbers, those numbers are irrelevant, right? Because the system lacks the political courage to actually take it on. The hardest, nastiest days, if you look at Europe, just look what's happening. Look what happened in the House of Commons yesterday when some conservatives stood up and said, We've had it with Europe. We want out. We want out of this whole mess. And they turned on each other. I said this on Hannity back in February 2010 when he had me. They had a special for Generation Zero, the first time outside the Passion of Christ they'd ever taken an hour for one movie. And I said, all the easy choices are in back of us. All the easy decisions were years ago. Everything from here on in is going to be hard and nasty and ugly, and you're going to be called every name in the book. You're going to be vilified. And we did cross a line this, this past week on the Occupy Wall Street. Only, I believe, in the revolution were there any marches on Tories' houses. When they left and they marched on um, Rupert Murdoch's house and Jamie Dimon's house and Mr. Koch's house, uh, and there was one other, four houses they actually marched on. That shows you the types of things that are going to happen. Cutting this budget, why is the budget not cut? Budget's not cut because it's not easy to cut. Everybody's going to have to take a hit here. And if we draw a line, and it has to be a tough line, that no more taxes, no more tax increases. You're just, you're just exacerbating a problem. You're, you're going to see this election. Newt Gingrich said on my show the other night, he thinks it's the most important since 1860. I think this election is going to be the nastiest, ugliest in the history of this country. It's going to be Americans for Prosper. I, I end the film The Undefeated. By the way, the film's not about Sarah Palin. It is Sarah Palin's story. But the reason I wanted to do it is that she is Walmart Nation. When the movie starts off, she's working on a commercial fishing boat in 1988 with her husband. They own a small commercial fishing boat. And she's not part of the, the cultural, political, economic or social elite in the Matsu Valley, which is out of the loop in a state that's out of the loop, right? She is so obscure. She's more obscure than anybody in America today when she starts off. And 20 years later, she's risen by being constant on a handful of principles. But the undefeated is the values of the Tea Party. It's the values. I've been around this country now for three years, showing these films and talking to these Tea Party groups. 
And these are the people that are, as Rick Santelli so brilliantly observed, they're those who carry the water, not those who drink the water. They're the ones that hold our social organizations together, build our cities, run our little leagues, fight our wars, right? It's the backbone of this country. And they're enraged, and here's why they're enraged. They understand we have a system now that has socialism, as you point out so eloquently. We have socialism for the very poor, right? A system that a trillion dollars a year in welfare state benefits with no taxes, right? And 60% of the country getting that. And we have socialism for the very wealthy, right? The, the, the anger of the Tea Party is not racism. It's not, they're not homophobes. They're not nativist. What they are is common sense, practical, middle class people that understand that they're paying for their own and their children's destruction, right? And that's the rage. You know, the bonus pool this year, the bonus pool on Wall Street of all the financial firms in 2000 in seven, the year before, in 2006 and 2007, the two years were all the transactions that imploded in 2008. The bonus pool is, about, is gonna be about the same this year, right? You know, TARP, when you said TARP, well, TARP, if, if our business, if your business or your business had gotten in trouble and Goldman Sachs, where I was trained, had come in and given you a, a, a financing, trust me, you would have been wiped out and you would have been fired, right? They weren't. All their stock is still is worth a t ton of money because they weren't. We basically gave them free money and bailed them out. There's no recession in the Hamptons. There's no recession in Georgetown. The other day, the Washington Post reports five of the seven wealthiest counties in the country are the suburbs of Washington, D.C. The per capita income in Washington, D.C., for the first time in history, is greater than Silicon Valley. That is not a random event. What Sarah Palin, the reason I wanted to make the movie, Sarah Palin went up against the political class in Alaska and big oil. Because it, it wasn't that it was corrupt. There's always going to be corruption. There's always going to be bad guys taking money. That's human nature. Read Plutarch. That happened back in Greece and Rome. We have something much worse. A compromised political class. Crony capitalism in a permanent political class. Right? It's quite simple. How does a guy go to Washington, basically making $100,000 a year as a lawyer in some locality, and at the end of 10 years, on $165,000 and another 15,000 by federal money he can make, having to keep basically sometimes two locations, how's his net worth $5 million? And in 10 years, like Harry Reid, how's Harry Reid's net worth $15 million? That's not even a mathematics, that's just arithmetic. How does that work? That's what the Tea Party, that's what this revolt is about. That's why we have grassroots organizations like AFP and Club for Growth. That's why we have things outside political parties, because people want their voice heard. You are the last line of defense. Three nights a week I do this throughout the country, and it's always the same hundred people in the room. But I will tell you, as Slade said so eloquently, if you look at the revolution, about a third of the people wanted liberty, a third of the people were hardcore Tories, and about a third were at, well, like in the middle and saying, I'm gonna see how this thing plays out, right? Our country today is about the same thing. We're a center-right nation of probably 70, 30 center-right, but there's only a small core that's prepared to take their Tuesday night and not just write a check, but actually throw your being like Jason and the team have in trying to change this, right? And that's what's going to save it. 100 years from now when they look back, if we come out of this crisis and we're still the country that Mark, Senator Rubio talked about of American exceptionalism based upon Judeo-Christian values, right? Believing in freedom and being the greatest country in the world in the torture of freedom, if we're that country and it's gonna take us 20 years to get through this, right? It's gonna be because of guys like you. And if you quit, we are done. Right? We're going to be something very different on the other side. I mean, you can already see in, in President Obama, you can already see what that's going to be. Because right? that's just the harbinger. The Occupy Wall Street. I, I tell guys, don't dismiss these kids. Listen to them. Because it's a shot in the heart of what they believe. And that is off the, the education system that's taken more money than any education system in the history of the world. Listen to what they believe. That's the future. If you guys don't stand tall, 
So I, I want to conclude tonight in saying that I'm actually energized. And you know why? Think about it. I know all you guys do this. You all, you've all read history books since you were kids. And you all think, hey, if I was there during the Civil War, you know, I'd be right in the middle of it. Or if I was in the revolution, if the revolution, I would be right there, right? Or in World War II or the Great Depression, all that stuff that guys had the Great Depression or World War II, I would be there. I'd be in Normandy. I'd do all that. We have that opportunity today, right? They're going to look back at these 10 years, 15 years, and it's going to take us that long. And we're going to have, by the way, we're going to have defeats. There's going to be days when it looks, that's why you, I, I want you guys to see the movie, the, the, the um, um, Generation Zero, because the guy at the end of it tells you, kind of gives a broad perspective. There are going to be days that's going to look so gray and so overcast and like we've lost, like the day Obama won. We're going to have more days like that. But if we hold together and we see it in exactly what you said, there's so many people that believe in what we believe and understand when you start talking to them and engaging them that we're, you know, we're not cloven hoof devils. We're not nativist, homophobic, racist, right? But they, they understand that we believe in what made this country great, and they believe it too. But they're inundated with a mass media and an education system that's really stolen that from them. And for every Drudge or Andrew Breitbart or these little things you have, for every AFP and for every Club for Growth and for every one of these organizations, you've got this overwhelming apparatus and apathy. Apathy of the middle and apparatus on the left. But we can do it. And I've seen it. And we've seen it in 2010. That victory was humongous. And I realize people, some people are upset that Governor Palin is not running or they're they're searching for the man on the white horse and one day it's Governor Perry and one day it's Herman Cain and everything like that. It's not about any one individual. It's about teams. It's about doing this. It's about next year when we have this, on the first annual shareholders meeting, we have 500 people in this room. And half of them are under the age of 40. It's ideas. And it's, and it's, it's taking those ideas in action. And trust me, you guys are on the right path. This is not a waste of your time. Because if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. And if it doesn't get done, we're going to lose this country. And we're going to be looked at, listen, this is the last thing I want to leave you with. Only one, gen I think there's been 14 generations in this country's history. Only one generation is looked down as not having fulfilled the Burkean Compact, which is we owe as much to the people who came before us as the people before us. We're an agent in time, right? And we have a sacred duty to withhold traditions of the past, our best traditions, and pass them on to the future. Only one generation in our history didn't do that. That was the generation of leadership before the Civil War. Civil War could have been averted. It wasn't because of a failure of leadership. We are the baby boomers in this room. We're the second generation that's going to be looked at as having let this country down unless we turn immediately and get our hands around the problem. And through the Tea Party, through these grassroots movements, through things like Liberty Restoration, we're doing that. And, and trust me, there's tremendous power in doing this. So thank you very much. I'm here to help you guys anytime you want.